So we go on with our program today. Um, as I say, uh, this panel is entitled Prevention and Prejudice, Counter-Radicalization and Human Rights Challenges. And uh, I have to say that uh, probably, as you know, initially we were uh, uh, thinking and we invited Amrit Singh, uh, work, working at the Open Society Justice Initiative. Um, she is also an author of a really important uh, um, report about PREVENT that we are going to speak about today. Uh, I just want to tell you that you can find the copy also at the entrance if you want. This one is called Eroding Trust. And just I wanted to mention Amrit because, uh, in a sense, uh, she was a really important uh, person in preparing this panel that uh, uh, we have been uh, dealing and speaking about with John Goetz now for months, <laughs> how to organize it. And uh, uh, so, unfortunately, she could not come for personal reasons, but uh, I'm really happy to say that uh, then we found uh, uh, two other great speakers that uh, join on board, uh, Tufal Shudari and Sindan Kasim, that uh, you are going to introduce. And uh, I want to thank Michelle Hassan, that is sitting here close to John Goetz, uh, from the Radicalization Awareness Network, uh, RAN Education, uh, that is also present with us, and the RAN Network uh, also to support this panel. Um, so I just uh, want to start by introducing John. Um, and I think, in a sense, it's also really interesting how we finished the panel before, because it was also mentioned the drone war. And uh, John was uh, participating in one of our first events in April 2015, when we invited the drone whistleblower Brandon Bryant. So this was actually the moment in which we started the Disruption Network Club. We were speaking about drone attacks, the drone war, and so on. Um, and also it's the moment in which also with John we started to, you know, collaborate and interact. <laughs> and finally we decided also to uh, create this panel. So I want to thank John because I think he's also thanked to you that we have this panel here uh, today. And uh, John Goetz is a US-born investigative journalist and author based in Berlin since 1989. Can I say that? <laughs> and um, he worked as appeared in the Sunday Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and also worked as a reporter for the German news, uh, news weekly Der Spiegel. Uh, he has been working since long time as NDR editor for investigation at uh, RRD Hauptstadt Studio and also as a member of the investigative team of the Süddeutsche Zeitung. And uh, yeah, so I want to leave to you now the duty to introduce <laughs> the rest of the speakers and thank you very much for being here. Um, yeah, good evening. Um, the name of the panel is Prevention and Prejudice, Counter-Radicalization and Human Rights Challenges. And the idea was to take a critical look and a look basically also from the field at how does actual counter-radicalism work in Europe. And um, we're going to begin the panel by talking about uh, the kind of model of counter-radicalization in Europe right now, which is in the UK, and it's a program called PREVENT. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we decided to have the panel, was to really to take a closer look at PREVENT and to see how it actually works. Tufel will be speaking about that uh, as the first pa panelist. Um, one thing to note is when we talk about counter-radicalism, radicalism, we're not talking about counter-free market radicalism. We're not talking about um, radical Catholicism. We're not talking about, for the most part, also about Nazis. We're talking very, it's a one directional type of counter-radicalism and that's, that's one of the things that we'll be talking about. Um, Michelle Hassan, uh, I will also introduce when, her, when she begins her talk, um, is involved in actually training teachers about radicalization and she has an interesting perspective on, on this and um, 
Sidja and Kasim will be talking about prevent, tile, uh, prevent style um, counter radicalization programs in Germany. So let's begin, please, with uh, Tufjol. Um, he is the assistant professor at the University of Durham Law School in England and senior research affiliate of the Canadian Terrorism, Security, and Society Research Network. His research focuses on issues of counterterrorism, radicalization, and racial and religious discrimination. Um, and his quote to start off his um, talk um, is about prevent, and it is, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, never have so many studied so few to understand so little. Hey. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about um, the experiences in the UK of the PREVENT program. Um, I should say it, the PREVENT program doesn't apply to the whole of the UK, it only applies to Great Britain, so it doesn't apply to Northern Ireland. But I'll come back to why that's significant in understanding some of the dynamics and challenges or way in which what it reveals about PREVENT and what we can, um, how, it, how it reveals itself through the fact that it doesn't apply to Northern Ireland. Um, I'll just begin talking a little bit about the background to PREVENT and how it developed in the UK and I think that will give you a sense of the criticisms that have emerged, the challenges that have been made of PREVENT, and then talk about some of the research that I've been involved in, which has been um, talking to teachers um, and staff in schools in England about their attempts to try and implement this policy that's been given to them, that they're required to do um, since the, over the last two years. So how, what, what, how have they tried to make sense of it, and what does that show about how it's being implemented and working in, in, in England? So PREVENT is part of the UK's overall counter-terrorism strategy called CONTEST. Um, it really started to be to take off after um, the July 7 um, bombings that took place in London. So it started off as a, um, took off um, after 2005. And initially PREVENT was actually not about schools and teachers. It was a program that was aimed at engaging with civil society and so large amounts of funding was given to civil society to try and prevent young people from being um, becoming extremists, violent extremists. It was about getting drawn into terrorism. Um, and that engagement with civil society took place through um, funding from the government. So the government was involved in giving quite a huge chunks of money and the first thing that, the first criticism of PREVENT was that it was almost entirely focused on Muslim communities. So the distinction was made between international terrorism and domestic terrorism. And domestic terrorism was Northern Ireland, and international terrorism was essentially Al Qaeda. And so all of the PREVENT money went towards Muslim communities, was targeted at Muslim communities. And in fact, when the money was first allocated, the amount of money that local areas received was based was based upon the percentage of the Muslim population. So the higher the Muslim population, the more money you got. So that was the initial kind of criticism. This is profiling the entire community, saying this community is a risk, and this community is suspect, and therefore we'll put money into the community based on how many Muslims there are in, in the local community. Um, the initial prevent, so prevent one as I call it, um, from 2006 to 2010 um, was focused around what was then termed violent radicalization, so people who were involved in some kind of action. But a lot of the funding was towards all sorts of other things. So local authorities were given millions of pounds and told to go and engage with local Muslim communities and try and identify who these young people are. And what happened was that you had this discourse of young people being at risk of radicalization. So local authorities said, we have this money, uh, we need to spend it, uh, we need to spend it this year, but we need to spend it on young people who are at risk of radicalization. And lo local communities who didn't have any money before were suddenly said, well, we've got this project to do with improving educational attainment. We've got this project to do with football. Can we use it for that? And he goes, well, we can't use it for that unless it's to prevent young people who are at risk of radicalization. And so you had this whole discourse where communities said, well, these people are at risk of radicalization, therefore we can have the money. But essentially, they were being used to do all sorts of projects which they would have done, which they wanted to do for years but didn't have the money to do. But now that prevent money was going into it, they could do it as long as they said the young people were at risk of radicalization. So that created a whole discourse in which communities began to see themselves or began to talk about themselves as being at risk 
of radicalization. And that had a side-on effect, which was that other communities said, well, we'd like money for our young people to do leadership courses, to do homework clubs, to do football clubs, but why don't we get that money? And so it, created, it also created tensions because Hindu communities, Sikh communities, Chinese communities say, well, how come we don't get money for doing this? What do we have to do to get this sort of money? So it actually undermined cohesion at the local level. It actually undermined um, community relations because Muslims were seen as getting money because of terrorism and they were giving huge amounts of money to do all of these projects which were essentially community capacity building um, projects around you know, football and homework clubs, all of those kinds of things. Then the government changed in 2010 and the Prevent policy changed after review in two important ways. One was that Prevent was now, was now going to be about all forms of extremism. So this would include far-right extremism as well. And, and the second change was that it was no longer just about violent radicalization, it was going to be about non-violent extremism. And the idea that it, Prevent was about non-violent extremist ideologies and ideas that lead to Extreme, lead to violence. But of course, it wasn't entirely clear what nonviolent extremism was. The government provided a helpful definition saying, well, nonviolent extremism is um, vocal opposition to fundamental British values. So, vocal opposition to fundamental British values makes you an extremist. Um, a few, uh, you may have been aware, a few weeks ago, um, a British foreign minister suggested that British um, foreign fighters shouldn't be allowed to return to the UK, they should be killed. And to me, that seemed to be a vocal opposition to fundamental British values of the rule of law. So if, if Prevent is followed through, and if the definition is applied effectively, then he should also be seen as somebody who is an extremist. Um, so the, the sort of core criticisms of Prevent are twofold. One is that it stigmatizes and uh, stigmatizes the entire community, showing them to be at suspect and at risk. Secondly, it relies upon um, the concept of radicalization, and that's a concept that remains uh, at the very least contested in terms of its scientific underpinning. And so that all of Prevent only makes sense if you have a coherent model that says there is this thing called radicalization and you can identify what the markers of radicalization are. And I think, within, at least in the scientific community, um, people who work in terrorism studies would say that that's very contested and the scientific basis is quite... Um, it is quite weak. Um, John Horgan, who's a professor of terrorism studies in the US, um, has, has a great quote that I use when I'm teaching, which is that the absence of a profile isn't due to the failure of research, it's the result of research. And he also said in an interview with a um, highly academic um, magazine called Rolling Stone magazine, and he said, the idea of radicalization causes terror is perhaps the greatest myth alive today in terrorism research. First, the overwhelming majority of people um, who hold radical views do not engage in violence. And second, there is increasing evidence that people who engage in um, violence don't hold radical views. So the two don't necessarily um, connect. So that's the other criticism is that around the extent to which radicalization, which underpins the policy, is scientifically valid and how much evidence there is for it. Um, but in the UK, the communities also became very suspicious of Prevent because it was seen as a way of monitoring and surveilling um, communities. There's a great book by Aaron Kunnani called Spooked, which talked about how Prevent was being used to uh, monitor communities and a, a, government's, a parliamentary select committee inquiry wasn't able to say that this was disproven by the Home Office. So they said, we can't really reach a conclusion. We need to have further independent research on this. Um, and I think partly because of that disengagement from communities with Prevent, the state increasingly turned to the one group that it has a lot of control over, which is the public sector, which is um, public officials. So Prevent increasingly effectively turned away from engaging with civil society to requiring state actors to, um, to have this duty under Prevent. So in 2015, the new legislation came into place which required um, selected authorities to have due regard to the need to prevent, young, prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. And that duty applies to schools, it applies to health um, hospitals, it applies to universities, it applies to all sorts of public sector organizations. So in all of those organizations, there's now a legal duty to prevent young people from being drawn into terrorism, or to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. And as a result, you've had a huge amount of training 
um, in schools, for example, of trying to see, well, what are the indicators of risk that you need to look out for? And what are the kinds of things that you need to make sure that would raise your suspicion? Um, and in schools, it was identified as part of safeguarding. So it was saying, well, this is part of your job as a teacher to safeguard young people, which makes it very difficult to resist because who would be against safeguarding young people? Who would be against making sure that they're okay and that they're being looked after and they're not getting into trouble? Um, I think that so the statutory duty came in, and since it's come in, there's been a huge increase in the number of referrals to the PREVENT program called um, Channel um, of people who are identified at being at risk. And some of this training will identify actions or behaviors that would um, lead to people being identified at being at risk. Um, so actions would include you know, being very withdrawn, um, it would be suddenly, sudden changes of appearance, sudden changes of friendship groups, having very extreme vocal views taking place, or as some people said, it's what teenagers look like. Uh, so there is an extent to which you know, you've pathologized um, teenage behavior and made it look extreme. Um, the, so it's, it's not surprising there's been a huge increase in, a uh, significant increase in the number of referrals that have taken place. 80% of those referrals that take place are then assessed. And 80% of the ones that are assessed are rejected. So they're saying these, aren't, these are false positives. And there have been some high profile examples of false positives that kind of show you the extent to which prevent does have, um, can, can have an effect or does have an effect on people's um, human rights, on their freedom of expression, and so on. Um, I'll just give you two examples. One is um, uh, involved a four year old, um, and the four year old had gone to school, he'd drawn a picture of what he thought was his father cu cutting up a cucumber. Um, but being a four-year-old, he, he couldn't really draw very well, so it looked at this big thing, and there's a, somebody with a knife holding and cutting it. And, oops, and, um, uh, and he couldn't say cucumber either, so the teacher thought he said it was a cooker bomb. And the teacher heard the word cooker bomb, looked at the picture of somebody holding a knife, and thought, well, this is very um, concerning. Um, the police were called, there was an interview that took place with the family to, to try and work out whether they were in fact um, radicalizing the, this young person. The other example is of, uh, of a teenager, and the teenager had actually, um, he, was, he was wearing Palestinian um, uh, scarf, he talked about Palestine in school, he, rose, he raised money for Palestinian causes, and initially the school was saying, well this is um, against school uniform, so therefore you can't wear this uniform, and then they confiscated his material. But eventually, he found that the police were actually called in, and they interviewed him and his parents about his political views, about his religious views, and interestingly, when he pointed out to them that he's a Shia, they said, well, that's okay then, because it's only certain types of Muslims we're looking for, um, and the interview ended quite quickly. Um, but those are examples of the kinds of cases that have come up as false positives of people who have been drawn into the system of prevent as a result of um, the wide indicators. So we, when we did the interviews with teachers, um, it was interesting to speak to them how they understood the training that they had and what impact that had on them. Um, and firstly, they were really worried about missing a genuine case. For them, and we, we, we interviewed people in schools where young people had gone to Syria and they looked at the material and they thought, you know, they don't, they don't want to be the teacher who misses any signs that the young person has. And, the, and so any sign that they can see, they begin to say, well, we should refer it on to somebody else within the school to make that assessment. Then we've done our job, we've done our safeguarding. So that's why you get to an increased number of referrals. Um, teachers move it, up, uh, move it up the system. And for them, that's quite important to sort of say, well, you know, somebody else is dealing with it. But also what we found was that Although the government would say that prevent isn't about conservative religious views, isn't about um, attacking expressions of conservative or, or, or expressions of religious um, views or religious practice, repeatedly teachers would identify things that, like suddenly they would come in growing with a beard, or the girl would be wearing a hijab, or they would write the word Allah, or and so on and so forth. So all of these were examples where this became the first point of thinking, well, I should make a further investigation. I should see if there's anything behind that. And so just that very process of saying, well, I should look further, means that there was an investigation that took place. The other, the other thing that happens in a lot of these schools is that the entire IT system is now monitored for anything that um, the, 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 the kids put into the search engines that could be seen as extremists. So we had one example of somebody who put in the search term flights to Syria 
in, and it got flagged up and the teacher's like, well, we called him and we asked him, why did you put that in? He goes, well, sir, my friend said you couldn't fly to Syria anymore. And I Googled it and I told him you, you could. And so there was, I mean, it was funny at, at one level, but at another level, you know, the kid got called in, his parents got called in, um, there was discussions with the police and there was a sense in which, well, we can't be too safe. We need to make sure that just in case anything is, is going to happen, that we do take all of these cases seriously. The last example I'll give um, is, how, uh, is a group of young women. Um, they'd done a video, um, they put it on YouTube, and in the video they talked about music, they talked about boyfriends. At the end of the video they said, uh, we as ISIS, and if you want to join ISIS, call this number, and they put some random number up on the, on the video. It's clearly satire. The school thought it was satire, but they said, well, we need to make sure that they understand that this isn't the sort of thing that you can make fun of. This isn't the sort of thing you should satirize because society won't accept it. Because, and, and the teachers genuinely thought they were protecting the children from wider society. But as a result, the child got suspended. And when we asked them, what did the child, how did they react? Well, we th the child thought we were overreacting. I thought, really? <laughs> um, so you have all of these examples. Um, just, and I, th I think it, comes to, it, it, it shows two issues that come up as a result of prevent. One is the breadth of the idea of nonviolent extremism means that a wide range of things can suddenly become suspect, suddenly become a point of further investigation and draw people into this process. And it's quite clear that part of that, part of the things that become um, come under suspicion are forms of religious behavior, religious expression, um, political expression. And as a result, what you'll, what, what, the, the risk is that people will start performing safe identities. They'll start finding, they'll start realizing, well, I don't want to be come under suspicion. And in some ways, that's what the teachers are doing in that case. They were teaching the children what is a safe identity to have as a Muslim. You shouldn't satirize ISIS. You shouldn't talk about ISIS because that will get you into trouble. And so it's teaching kids what is a safe Muslim identity to have in our society. And I think that's damaging in terms of freedom of expression, in terms of their rights to express who they are and what their, what their beliefs and ideas are. Um, the final point I wanted to make was around the exclusion of prevent from Northern Ireland. And I think that's quite interesting because one of the ways in which, one, one part of the duty in the UK is as part, as part of prevent is that kids are taught about fundamental British values and they're taught about um, they're taught that if, if they learn about fundamental British values, this will build up their resilience to um, radicalization. But of course, the idea that you go into school in Northern Ireland and saying, well, we will teach you fundamental British values in the part of the UK where Britishness and Irishness are contested sh meant that it's far too difficult to do that. And it showed the, di the challenge of the difficulty of trying to have a policy that has that as its backdrop. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, Does this work as well? Um, I just wanted just two other points I just wanted to mention about uh, prevent that I think are important. The, 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 the reason why it's, I think it's so fascinating is that it, it's kind of a, the most advanced form of mind control that I've ever encountered. The, the UK government has started, has created, it's a part of prevent, like 25, 30 Muslim organizations out of thin air that then get quoted on television all the time and tweet back and forth to each other. I mean, it's, they're, they're non-existent civil society organizations. It's really kind of fascinating how that works. And the other aspect which will bring me to Michelle is that it's the entire civil service, social workers, doctors, anyone employed by the state, as well as teachers, are legally required to report on their students. It's not an option. They are actually, so you have, you know, situations of trust with a doctor or with a teacher, and they are legally on another agenda while they are with their students thinking, am, do I, am I hearing something like, for example, the cucumber that I need to report on? Um, Michelle Hassan, our next speaker, is the co-leader of the uh, EU counter-radicalization program called RAN. Uh, the Radicalism Awareness Network. Uh, she was previously a principal in a Parisian secondary school uh, and is now also an inspector of schools in Paris. Um, the quote that I have from her is that um, there is a real problem with Islamic radicalization in schools um, and we cannot turn our back on it. 
schools are the best place to speak about radical ideas. If not there, then where? Michelle. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I need a little technical assistance. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So as you understand, I'm French, and I'm, uh, but I'm representing here the Run Red Network, and I will try to present to you what we've, we are discussing about the issue of preventing um, radicalization and extremism in educational settings. We are aware there are prejudices uh, that could be uh, uh, addressed to human rights, so it's uh, how it works in the network. So I'm sorry my English is not good enough to speak spontaneously, but I will be reading and I hope you excuse me for this. So first of all, what is RAN? So um, launched in 2011 by the European Commission was in the network of practitioners who work daily with people who have been radicalized or are vulnerable to radicalization, such as teachers, youth and social workers, police officers, psychologists, prison and probation staff. In one, there are 10 working groups. Communication and narrative, education, the one I'm co-chairing, exit, youth families and communities, local, prison and probation, police, remember victim of terrorism, health and social care, and we have a group of random people. What is RAN DNA? It's involving and training first-line practitioners. That's why I do uh, in my main work. And we consider that prevention is key, and we'll discuss what we mean by prevention. We consider that multi-adjusted approach is key, and we want to involve NGOs, communities at risk, victims, and also farmers. We recommend tailor-made interventions adapted to local circumstances. What is one definition of radicalization? Because it's a word that is sometimes difficult to understand and we don't all really are uh, sharing the same idea on this. For the RAN network, radicalization is a process by which a person comes to adopt extreme, extreme political, social, religious ideas or aspirations leading them to reject diversity, tolerance, and freedom of choice. It is important for us in the Nuran Black work to draw a line between ideas, even if extreme, and violent actions. It's not the same to have the ideas to do, to do things. It is important to focus on the capacity to make a well-informed discernment also between different types of violence. So now, So we had a manifesto for education. The manifesto for education was a text that was written by a group of practitioners, as we understand, we are a network of practitioners, and it's a call to action. We consider that education can play a role in preventing violent extremism. We consider that all schools have the objective to provide, the objective to provide a safe and respectful environment for their students but we consider also that schools ta uh, can tackle these issues alone. Okay, I try that. Is it better for you? Oh, we have to have the whole of it, okay. Is it good? No? Okay. So we consider that teachers are the front line to secure democracy. Education plays an important, power, an important role in shaping the identity of children and youngsters and transmitting de democratic and social values. Teachers are the front line when it comes to potentially identifying early signs of radicalization. They are well positioned for prevention work, both for identifying and safeguarding vulnerable young people at risk of radicalization, and for teaching critical thinking skills for the first stage of education. The working group on education focuses on the need to better equip teachers so they can play a crucial role in preventing radicalization leading to violence. The aim of the network is to raise awareness of the topic, but also to empower and strengthen capacity to deal with radicalization in the education setting. 
It's important we share with you, with you our view on radicalization and radical. You can imagine with an assembly of teachers, it has been quite a long debate about this because people say we don't want to use this word radicalization. So there, was, there is a lot of confusion and there has been a hated debate about the term radical, radicalization, extreme ideas and extremism. We consider that if schools should provide a safe place to discuss anger, perceived injustice and concern, we'd, but we don't have problems with radical. I have to say here that for most uh, participants, it's nice and it's useful to be a radical. We consider that in society, if we if don't have radicals, society will never change. So we are not against radicalization when it's uh, to make ideas progress. But we consider there is a real problem, however, when radicalization leads to a breach to, of human rights or hate crimes or even to extremist violence and terror. So we have come to the heart of the matter now. It's educating in a safe and respectful way. You will all agree that educating is a relationship, is a relationship based on trust. And the teachers say we won't spy on our students. There have been strong discussion between the participants. There is an awareness that the prevention programs may fuel discrimination and stigmatize, stigmatize pupils and families. In some countries, when there is a statutory duty to refer pupils or students to authorities, it makes field teachers uncomfortable and in need of training. Is preventing violent extremism directly linked to the context of teen is, that's the question, I'm sorry, is PVA directly linked to the contents of, teach, of teaching? Teachers say we are not social workers, we are not policemen, we are teachers. Could teachers be used uh, in, a, in a field that is not theirs? So there is new challenges for educators and teachers now. Has, I remember, I'm sorry to remember your name, but as you say that uh, the Netherlands and UK were the first to implement uh, prevention programs, and at first the other countries modelized on uh, the UK and uh, the Netherlands, but now there are many others that are not so focused on uh, the referral to police. We prefer to have a better educative approach. So teachers say that we don't want to spy on our students but we are willing to safeguard our pupils, the school climate, and the public safety because many young people go to school and we can play a role. That's all the questions those teachers had in the working group. Could we start for what schools already know, that is using the safeguard processes that we use already to protect young people from gangs, drug abuse, physical and sexual abuse? It is indeed the mission of schools and teachers to educate future citizens both in knowledge, sorry, information and attitudes, but how to do it with growing polarization in society and with the security issues. How to react when pupils' words or attitudes threaten democratic values in the classroom or in the school activities. How protect pupils and students from conspiracy theories and violent propaganda. How to be equipped to spot size or radicalization. In this next slide, you can see what is the teaching issues for many of uh, the teachers we have been spoken to, speaking to, because they say we can't even sometimes address a normal curriculum, because teachers, students don't want to speak about it. They refuse uh, either the historical facts or the scientific facts, so it's, it's quite difficult sometimes. Also, it becomes very difficult to hold some conversation in the classroom. Here you have a slide. Um, I'm French, as you know. I thought when they heard the Paris attack and the Charlie Hebdo attack, the day after in the school, it was quite challenging for the teachers because the kids, they didn't want to speak about geography or to hear about mathematics. They wanted to hear about what happened. The teacher was at the front line for that, and they have 
in the same classroom, be, be, be younger students, those two positions. <coughs> We have to face it. Schools are confronted with radicalization and issues relating or reading to it. Many teachers find themselves in threatened, in heated debates, facing extreme and sometimes violent opinions in challenging conversation. They try to discuss sensitive topics and deal with opposing, be or opposing behavior of their students. Sco some schools were even confronted with an empty chair in the classroom from a student who has left to the so-called so so Islamic State. The terrorist attacks scare, frustrate, or anger young people, cause provocation, tensions, and protest in the classroom. <coughs> Excuse me. Just a few words about freedom of speech. Because it's, it, was what, uh, it was a question, freedom of speech. The right to freedom of expression includes freedoms to hold opinion and to receive and import information and ideas. But this exercise carries duty and responsibility in a democratic society. Schools and educators invest at an early stage in teaching democracy. In the educational context, hate speech or speech contrary to common values of our democratic society may justify intervention from the educators and lead to dialogue. Of course, this dialogue must be respectful of fundamental freedoms, cultural and religious diversity, but it has to promote common shared values. This is a cucumber. <laughs> we didn't talk before, but we use the cucumber case as a training case. So you remember it was a four years old board who drew this, uh, made this drawing of his father having a cucumber, and the mistress misunderstood and thought it was a cucumber. So we, you, we use that in training with our teachers. <coughs> so concerning risk assessment, we have to think twice. Start from the beginning. School principals and teachers are educators. They've chosen this job because they like, or they're supposed to like to educate young people. They care, most of them, for their pupils, and they don't want to intimidate them and their families to stigmatize them and to report them on, to authority on the basis of quick, vague analysis, without absence of knowledge and without crosses view, being unconscious of their biases of prejudices. They are willing to identify and address sensitive issues in a safe way, both for the individual and for the group, the classroom, the school. They want to respect the right to privacy. They cooperate in the local field with health and social care. So this is, uh, well, as I told you, the, the training came on Cucumber. <coughs> For a teacher, very clear guidance is needed because teacher is not a superman. If we consider teachers as role models, let's put it this way. How, how teachers can be considered as such, that is, role models, in democratic, for democratic education is they are perceived to be discriminating a, a category of pupils. In the aim to provide knowledge on all cultures, are most curriculum updated to new challenges in society? And the answer is no. The curriculum has not, has not been updated in many European countries. Do all teachers receive sufficient information on the subject for radicalization and violent extremism to have the tools to properly respond to expressions of grievance or injustice in the classroom or in the school? The answer is no. To cooperate in a multi-agency approach with school partners and see parents and families as valuable partners is quite a challenge also. And in the end, cooperation between schools and law enforcement needs, needs clear information. Teachers and school leaders are not so happy to have police in their schools. So it needs really to build the cooperation and a trustful relationship. So you understand it now. We have to invest in training programs very seriously in Europe, as um, the young man from Belgium said. Schools and school staff members need to be equipped in an area that is complex and not familiar to them. We have to understand that if we want to be really active, 
we have to understand what's happening in our society. And it's not so easy for our school teachers and school leaders. In the context of growing polarization, very polarized world, and in a violent extremism, many teachers voice a concern for a lack of training. They say they're not trained enough in many, many countries. Poor, unaccredited and unregulated training has been recognized, exacerbating the confusion around prevention programs, just as you say. <coughs> and to finish, this is what our working group uh, advice for training teachers. We have uh, built a program called Effective and Confident Teachers and Other School Staff. We have different types and level of training. Fundamental training for uh, just what is, what is radicalization, what is violent extremism, how can uh, you as a standard normal teacher can address the issue in your classroom. We have a training for safeguarding and creating safe and democratic schools. Also, it's not so easy to have debates in the classroom. It's difficult, as you know. And in fact, we propose training for, to face today's challenges, such as me media literacy, fake news, conspiracy theories, depolarization training, to have a peace and social stability in the school, to deal with culture, religion, ideology, and identity. Just to give you an idea of what we are doing, next year we are going to Budapest to work on fake news, and uh, then we will work uh, later on on uh, how to work with victims of terrorism, but also farmers. Because as we want to have a real democratic debate in the classroom, we want the kids to be able to hear victim of terrorism voice, but also the testimony of farmers that could be interesting for them to hear. Thank you for attention. Uh, as you probably noticed, there's, so there's different points of view on, on counter-radicalization, and I hope when we get into the debate part, we can get into that. The, our next speaker uh, is uh, originally from Karl-Marx-Stadt. Uh, his work revolves around a critical view of preventative measures of so-called Islamic extremism, as he phrases it himself. He's a research associate at the University of Münster, uh, and he previously worked at uh, the NGO here in Berlin called uh, UNFUG which was kind of part of the Radicalization Awareness Network of the EU. Um, the quote that he chose to give is, uh, to start off his talk is, um, prevention is part of a bigger hegemonic project to discipline Muslims in Germany and leads to the neoliberalization of education. So, uh, Sinjan Kassem. Thank you. Well, I don't know if this was the Frugian slip, as you might call it. The NGO is not called Unfug, <laughs> it's called Ofug, <laughs> um, which is Arabic and means horizon. But, um, you know, you might say that it's Unfug as well. <laughs> um, I will not try to make this argument, I will try to make another argument in my uh, presentation. Um, I put down two um, basic questions. I think, I think we already addressed the first one. Um, um, you know, how do vague uh, conceptualizations of radical, radicalism or radicalization um, actually lead to infringements of human rights? But I will um, just give you, you know, um, some of my own findings or some current examples um, from Germany. And then I will try to, um, although I'm at the very beginning of my own research, I will try to make the argument or build the argument um, that it is revealing to actually understand prevention as part of a hegemonic project. Um, if you think of the German perspective on the so-called war on terror, um, it often seems that you know, the German way is um, the peaceful way or you know, it's uh, completely opposed to the actual war on terror that um, you know, with the saying of Joschka Fischer, the, um, the foreign minister in 2002 who said, I'm not convinced uh, in front of um, the Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz. Um, it was like, you know, the Germans are making the case for human rights and whatever. But it's very interesting that actually in 2004, so after the, um, uh, the Germans did not take part in the invasion of Iraq, but in 2004, Peter Struck, um, the Minister of Defense at the time, actually declared in an official government paper that, you know, the, the freedom of Germany and the security of Germany is, is defended at the Hindukush as well as at other places. 
So um, I'm mentioning this. Um, this was a huge, you know, there was a huge debate at the time. But I'm mentioning this because it just um, is part of, of a bigger frame of the war on terror, I think, and it shows that. Um, people or politicians or people in general are actually willing to give up human rights um, when it comes to facing political Islam or Islamic extremism or whatever you might to call it. So people are actually willing to, to take the risk of um, spying on other people, um, interrogating people, actually killing people. Um, as Arun Kundani actually put it, um, I think, very um, explicit in his study, um, the Muslims are coming. Um, we seem to to um, claim the right for ourselves to be you know, secure and to, to have freedom, while well, we actually um, make uh, other people subjects to interrogation killings. Um, we did not even declare war on them officially, we're just killing them by drones. So I just wanted to, um, to make this brief comment at the beginning to actually show that the German way is nothing special, it's actually a big part of uh, this whole project war on terror. Although the Europeans for some times actually um, like to think of themselves as being opposed to the um, crusade that the US was doing, um, it's still part of the same thing. And it still goes on. Um, although we do not have in Germany, actually, I, th I, th I think it's my um, impression, we do not have a very big discourse on human rights. I mean, maybe I'm outside of it, I'm not just hearing it, but you know, the human rights discourse is, I think, something very um, um, Anglo-Saxon, let's say, or American Anglo-Saxon, because I, am, I'm, I never actually understood myself as a human rights advocate, when in fact um, speaking about prevention could definitely mean to just point out human uh, rights infringements. And I just po um, put down those three examples. Um, I don't know if you remember the case of uh, Murat Kurnmas. Actually, I just... Um, um, knew or um, got to know that um, you were very, um, you were a key figure in actually making this an open case or bringing this to the public. Um, Murat Konas was um, held prison, um, or, yeah, held um, in, in Guantanamo from I think 2002 to 2006 without charges. And although, um, um, uh, what, what was, what's his name? Steinmeier. Although Steinmeier, who is now our president, um, actually did know or had the intelligence that um, it were, he, there were no charges, he did not bring him back to, um, to Bremen, which was um, his actually you know, place um, of uh, where he lived. Actually, um, this was clearly a human rights, you know, infringement. But there was um, for a long time no discussion, no debate about it, and we still in Germany, um, yeah, um, we, we do not talk about this so openly. I think uh, Steinmeier is, is still, you know, to apologize for this, and um, as I said, he, he did become the, you know, the president of, of Germany very recently. Um, you might say that this is an example from the past, you know, this is why I put down two, uh, two newer ones, or two ones uh, more, con more from, you know, from this year, actually. Um, just to mention that um, in Germany we do not have a national strategy on prevention, which sometimes you know, prompts people to say, yeah, the German way of doing prevention is uh, much better than, for example, the PREVENT program in the UK or in the Netherlands. There is no, we don't have you know, um, a PREVENT office, you know, which is um, directly linked to the security agencies, for example. Uh, in Germany, we, for, for a long time, there was um, the, the approach to actually fund civil society agencies to do the work for them, basically. Um, it has to be stated that although uh, the work was done by NGOs, the NGOs were still linked to um, security agencies, just uh, the federal police or the Verfassungsschutz or, or whatever, and there were referrals, of course, and all the knowledge which was, which, uh, was used to, um, to de-radicalize or to, to set up those prevention programs were actually informed by you know, intelligence, so all the knowledge is based on um, um, in, yeah, the knowledge of security agents anyway. So, um, although there was no law or no national program, we now actually um, can observe that um, I think there's a development of um, preventionization going on, which leads into the direction of, um, you know, making prevention uh, or by implementing prevention by law, just as in the UK. For example, in Bremen, we have um, discussions ongoing about a so-called early warning system against radicalization in schools with um, teachers who are actually already put on the front line of you know, the, the anti-radicalization war or uh, measures or program or whatever you want to call it. 
um, are made um, or are obliged or are going, maybe are going to be obliged by law to actually refer people who, are, who seem to be radical to security agencies, you know, the police. It's very interesting that in the ongoing debates about this, there is absolutely no, um, no definition of what being radical actually means, but all points, of course, to the, um, the same things that you mentioned before, you know, um, very, you know, um, very, actually, yeah, very generic um, attributes and characteristics are mentioned, like growing a beard or, you know, coming back from the summer vacation wearing a veil or something like that. This is the first sign to be alert and then you have to observe and, and so on. Um, this uh, law is still not passed, but there's another very interesting law um, now in Bavaria. There was no um, big discussion about it, and I honestly, um, I have to say for myself, I didn't really uh, knew this when it, pa when it was passed in summer. I just got to know very recently that um, the so-called Gefährdergesetz, Gefährder is a very German term um, describing a person um, which, which has the potential to be dangerous in the future, so to say, though there's actually no charge. Um, it's a pre-crime detention basically um, in place there and uh, the period of, um, you know, um, basically in the Federal State of Bavaria being able to help people in prison has been elongated from two weeks to three months and this period can always be renewed um, in a very simple process by, by judges. So basically this, is, um, this is, has the potential for infinitely putting people into jail without charges. And there was no outcry about it. I mean, this, these are clear infringements of human rights and um, I personally will try to make the case in the future to, uh, to, um, um, to actually speak about this more openly, but um, I think at the moment there is no institution, for example, like the Open Society Justice Initiative uh, in the UK or where it's operating, um, there is no discourse about at the moment in Germany. People are still thinking of themselves as, you know, um, actually having, um, well, found a good way to, to deal with those situations. Ah, this is the wrong, the wrong direction. The wrong direction. Can you just click maybe for me? Yeah, this is this uh, this was very good actually. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, I just want to address very briefly um, what I call the the myth of the middle because when we when we talk about radicalization um, and extremism, very soon we, we're going to use the concept, you know, of the middle of society and shared values and common values. When in fact, I think that um, this is the myth that we just uh, reproduce in order to, to criminalize certain people who are actually um, holding anti-establishment views. I put down here the question, which I think is still unanswered, you know, what, what is it radical actually and what is radicalization? Um, I personally don't know of any definition of radicalization or being radical, which is, uh, which is you know, um, not leading or, you know, lead, uh, or focusing on Islamic extremism, for example. I just, um, I just talked to, to a friend from Greece uh, some, some days ago and we talked about that being radical, in fact, is actually something very positive in, in the Greek language. And he recently got to work for the EU and he had to change his own mindset a little bit because when he got there, he was in his interview, he said, yeah, I'm working on radicalization and this is going to be really great. I'm really looking forward to it. And then during the interview, he actually, um, you know, he, well, he got to know that it's not that big of a deal. It's just, you know, anti-radicalization measurements, basically. Um, my own study at the moment focuses on, on so-called counter-narratives because in, in recent years, um, you know, it wasn't, the war on terror was not just, you know, um, by, well, by weapon, it was also the, you know, the heart, the heart, you know, the war for, or the struggle for hearts and minds, basically. And uh, counter-narrative has been a concept which was introduced and reproduced very, you know, without questioning it, basically, but I think in itself it is actually very revealing of what um, counter-radicalization or counter-extremism measurements actually are, because I think it's just, as I put it here, a retelling of the, of the myth of the middle. Um, I personally think that, um, and I, I'm, I am, there's evidence that for, in Germany especially, 
uh, preventive measures against Islamic extremism are almost always based on ideology. So these are almost always educational measurements, you know, um, f um, countering or, or giving alternatives to the ideology of Islamic extremism. When in fact, I think uh, the grievances themselves, which um, um, are leading people to, to think of alternatives, are never, ad are never really addressed in those me measurements. And counter-narrative as a concept actually is just a retelling of, of um, the status quo, which is, you know, responsible for those grievances. Um, you know, an example would be, for example, um, that in, in Germany we, we saw the, the, the rise of, of anti-Muslim or anti-anti-Muslim racism programs just due to the fact that there were some researches and studies showing that in so-called radicalization processes, discrimination um, makes people more vulnerable for, for the propaganda of the Islamic State, for example. So um, programs were set up where racism was addressed, but not in a, in a sense that um, radical views on, for example, institutional racism were actually promoted and actually counteraction was promoted, but just in the sense that, you know, um, people were told, okay, you experienced racism, um, you have to deal with it, you know, um, you have to integrate more. I mean, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating, um, but uh, you get the point. Um, and we know that this is bad for you, racism and so on, but you know, we have a great, uh, the society is great and we are very inclusive and so on. Uh, I think this is not the way to go. This is not, this is no counteraction. This is just retelling the myth of the middle. And of course, it's um, in general, um, those this vague conceptualization of radicalization, as already pointed out, leads to a culture of suspicion um, and stigmatization, of course, and securitization. And especially um, teachers who are, as I already said, put at the front line, um, who are you know, made, uh, made referring or are made to, to refer people um, to, to police agencies. Um, yeah, as you already mentioned, there, there's a lack of trust, basically. I try to click. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to establish this, uh, this term, <laughs> preventionization. Yeah, I, I can see you laugh, actually. <laughs> um, I know it's a horrible term. It's, it's actually a, you know, a very, very German term, probably. But um, I, I tried to use it to, to show um, what was already described at, at the widening and, and the, the, you know, the... Um, broadness, is that the word? Broadness of those preventive measures who are actually um, not only addressing violent extremism but everything that is much before, um, you know, happening before violence. In fact, I think that uh, preventive measures are, are thought of to be even greater when they start uh, or the, the, the longer they start before actually violence happens. So generic prevention basically means targeting everyone of a certain target group and it basically uh, means that Muslim youngsters are, are targeted. Um, at the same time, this means um, this, this omnipresence of, of the prevent logic in itself um, means um, that the neoliberalization of social work and education is just, you know, deepened and, and furthered. I mean by that, that if, if you think of education and uh, social work, um, and not just as you think of it, if you, if you fund it for, um, as, prevention, as preventive measures, and if you make people do preventive measures when they actually want to do something else, um, you make those people uh, um, having to answer to, to the logic of prevention, and all the evaluation is done due to the prevent logic. Uh, further funding is actually dependent on, on the prevent logic itself. So actually, this actually leads to you know, people having to quantify their own work, and then to just, you know, um, yeah, I think basically that's what I mean with the term neoliberalization. And um, I put it here as last one. Prevention is always used as, um, well, as an instrument to, to get to know um, which side are certain people on. So I think this is a question rightly addressed to Muslims in Germany right now. Which side are you actually on? Um, very interestingly, I think that uh, for a long time now, uh, Muslims in, in Germany, especially, not especially, but uh, as well, maybe, made, uh, you know, made, uh, made the demand to, that they actively want to particip participate at society. Often when we talk about participation, this is something 
that uh, the, the well, society, you know, tells the, the, the marginalized people you have to participate more, you know, don't have like your parallel societies or whatever, Bradford, Neukölln, I don't know. Um, but actually, from my own experiences, and there are there, there's evidence for this as well, Muslims want to engage, but in fact prevention and those whole pre uh, prevention programs makes Muslim engage in a certain way. An example, um, or not an example um, in specific, but a good example are mosques who for a long time in Germany um, you know, were very unprofessional, they, were, um, they had no, you know, no budget at all, now they have been discovered as spaces to, to detect um, people who are, you know, on, on the edge of radicalization or whatever. And certainly they are put right into the focus of a lot of preventive measures. So they are actually, you know, they, they can professionalize through this. So actually applying for a lot of money for grants. At the same time, by applying, they make themselves object to... Um, to, to being, you know, um, viewed on, um, being observed by security agencies because they have to, to say at first, you know, is this mosque actually okay or not? And um, then they can do the, their social work or preventive programs. But as I already said, this is basically a good measurement or a good instrument for, um, for, for the state or for, for people in power in general to see, okay, who's with us and who's not. And this is used. Um, this is this is actually used to um, to to make people or initiatives or mosques who are not participating in in those preventive uh, programs to actually exclude them from from society at all. There's, um, for example, one person in Germany, a, a woman. Uh, 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 she writes a blog. Um, and this this woman, in, in, you know, on her own, has actually the power. To, um, I mean, on, this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's actually true. She writes in her blog, she researches um, communities, initiatives, um, and then she writes an article about them on her blog, and she, she detects, you know, some, some contact uh, from one person in the initiative to the Muslim Brotherhood or to Hez Hezbollah or, you know, whatever. Um, some years back, and she puts this down in her blog, and then um, funders actually have to answer to this. And in a, um, in a lot of cases, um, corporations, um, actually good corporations, um, actually the whole establishment of the Muslim, of the Muslim uh, civil society in Germany has been um, subject to, to sabotage, basically, by this person, because she, um, well, yeah, she writes a lot of stuff about a lot of people. Um, yeah, and this, um, I want to conclude with this, just um, to, to explain what I mean um, when I say that it's very uh, rewarding to understand pre prevention or preventionization, I can hardly, um, you know, utter it myself, um, as a hegemonic project. Um, there are actually good cases made already um, who are focusing on the example of the Deutsche Islam Conference, which is a huge dialogue. It was supposed to be a dialogue platform, but for the first, uh, first 10 years or so, uh, um, it was established in 2006, and for the, for the first eight to 10 years, it was just you know, a platform where the state actually curated, so, um, yeah, let's say curate a number of Muslims to, um, to sit at a round table, and um, discuss security issues. And uh, this, of course, is all this, this curating process in itself is, of course, you know, an instrument to, to again, say um, who's with us, who's against us, um, who behaves, who does not behave. Um, the second is the establishment of the Centers for Islamic Theology, which is very interesting um, because Germany um, is not a secular state uh, per se. Um, for example, in, in schools, um, there is religious education, and Muslims, um, of course, wanted to have um, re Islamic education established in schools, which, um, for a variety of reasons, um, did not really happen as, uh, as they wished, um, which is also, due to, uh, to be honest, uh, due to uh, them or the, the organizations, Muslim organizations, not being too professional, but at the same time, um, that... Um, religious education is thought of 
as a preventive measure, basically. And those centers for Islamic theology were not established uh, with official funding and state funding or federal state funding as a, you know, as, a, as a sheer gift for the Muslim community. They were actually established because those are the centers where future religious uh, or Islamic religion teachers are educated and qualified. In fact, there's a very good uh, study by Farid Hafez on, ex on exactly this process in which it was, it was evident that security agencies such as the, um, the Verfassungsschutz actually um, had a huge influence on, on who's getting the, um, or who's uh, part of um, establishing those centers and who's not. So as, uh, again, it all leads to the question, um, who basically is the good Muslim and who's the bad? and who, who's able to decide who's who. And yeah, I think with that I'd like to conclude. So I, ideally we'd like to have a debate and we'd like to uh, open the floor and, and uh, feel free if there are comments and, and disagreements. And I, I guess my first question is basically, I mean, Tufiel, isn't some form of, I mean, the argument would get made, isn't some form of prevent or some kind of counter-radicalization counter program necessary? So I think much of what's done in the UK under prevent, um, there's two parts of it. One is monitoring students for signs of um, radicalization extremism, and the other part is the fundamental British values, teaching them about democracy and rule of law. So on that second part, teaching them about democracy, rule of law, all of those things, that's civic education. And I think what was interesting when we were speaking to teachers was that saying, well, this is what we used to do until the government stopped us doing civic education. So I, I'm all for schools doing civic education about um, liberal and democratic values, but that should be done because that's a good thing in itself and not because Muslims are a danger to society. That, you know, so, so society should, schools should teach democratic values and should teach that as part of what they teach all children. And I think it's the way in which it became, well, we'll teach fundamental British values to these children because they're not quite British and they may not have these values and they're a risk to society. That's when it becomes stigmatizing. So much of what prevent, much of the things that were done under prevent could easily be done without prevent. Um, and what happens, and this is the irony, is that a lot of these things don't, gain traction in policy circles until they're securitized. Then it goes up the policy scale, and, and so there's an, there's an impetus for doing it, but that process of securitizing it makes the thing that you're doing stigmatizing. So in, in the UK, the engagement with Muslim civil society organizations in the early prevent work was something that should have happened years ago because Muslims should be engaged, as everybody else is, on all sorts of policy issues. What happened was that Muslims were engaged on one policy issue. They, want, they were engaged on security. They weren't engaged about health or education or local policing or any, any of these other issues. So I think the, the challenge, the difficulty with Prevent is it engages with the community on one issue only and doesn't engage with all sorts of, on all the other issues. Um, and then on the, on the monitoring of uh, young people, I think uh, Michelle was talking about safeguarding. I think safeguarding is quite an interesting um, concept. And I think what we found was that teachers understood it as safeguarding because safeguarding is something teachers do all the time, as you said, in relationship to crime, um, gangs, sexual, uh, sexual exploitation, drugs. But the one difference I think that exists here is that in those cases, you're safeguarding young people from harm. In the case of prevent, it's not entirely clear whether you're safeguarding the young people from harm or whether you're safeguarding society from the young people. I think that's where the difference arises. And that's where, when you talk about safe spaces, for having conversations, I'm not sure that it is possible to have these safe spaces if, at the, if in the course of that conversation, the teacher is also looking out for whether there's something you're saying which is extreme, which is outside of what's acceptable. And there's, that's the balance. I mean, the teachers we spoke to said, all the kids know that anything they say isn't confidential. You know, anything you say, the kids will know that we, if, it, if, it's, if it raises concerns, then we have to share it. So it's not a safe space in that sense. Michelle, would you like to respond? Yes, what I, what I can see is that teachers are aware of that. They know it. And, uh, I can always also say that they don't want to engage at the same level. Some teachers, they don't want to engage at all. 
Some of them want to do their basic work on civic education and having a, a safe school and safe classroom. But there is also quite a large number of them who say we have a so societal issue. We have a problem in our society now. We have all those, um, those countries who have been attacked. We have all those uh, difficulties to have um, conversations in the class. But even more than conversations, we can't uh, teach some uh, historical facts. Or we can't. So what can we do? You know, that they're not so happy with prevention programs. I'm not sure most of them. But what is the alternative? If we don't do that, what do we do? We can't turn our back on the problem and say, we, well, it's, it's a fatality. Well, no. So what can we do? It's, I think it's a question for all of us, every one of us. And teachers feel they have a role to play. Because if you don't discuss this, uh, issues at school, where do you discuss them when you are 15 years old or 16 years old? Where do you discuss them? But, uh, but, but I think one of, the, one of the dangers that occurs is that, you're right, you say we must do something, this is something and therefore we must do it. I think that's the danger of saying, well, we've got to do something and therefore if this is the only thing we can think of, we must do it because uh, how, you know, we can't do nothing. And I think but I think the underlying problem, which um, you were alluding to, is that how secure is the idea of radicalization as a concept? Because the entire policy is based on the very concept of radicalization, that we can identify um, indicators that are reliable, that are worthwhile, that aren't vague. And that's, I think that's the fundamental challenge of the policy. And how do you prove it's not working? How do you prove that this is a policy that doesn't work? Just very quickly on this, that's working. Yeah, very quickly on this. Uh, what you are describing to me sounds very British. Uh, that means it's really linked to the Prevent Channel program in schools. What I can say here is that in the in the run, we have teachers and school leaders for all you, all over Europe, and there are other models. And when at first UK was first and pioneer of prevention programs, it's not anymore now. It's not because of Brexit, <laughs> it's another point. It's because we have other models um, that sounds to our ears better. I just, just to name the Danish model. Uh, maybe some of you know the city of Harris, Harris, and there was a model called the Harris model, that's a global uh, response of a, of a place to difficulties in uh, violent extremism. And in school, the Harris models sounds to our ears quite better than the British ones because it's, it's not stigmatizing as it is in Britain. It doesn't uh, challenge uh, the Muslim communities the same way. It's more uh, a kind of, you know, it's more open-minded and more living together. There is a system of mentoring when somebody f feels not so well, he can have some, someone to help on every issue, lodgings, uh, schooling, and anything. So we consider that this model is really more, uh, a word in French would be embrassé, that means embracing more hearty than the prevent program. So what you describe sounds very, very British to my ears, and I want to say that it's an other way of making prevention, because I'm really sure that we have to do something. I'm not sure that what we, that we do is perfect. I'm pretty sure that no. I'm pretty sure that we have to improve, but we have to act. But, but are, the, are these counter-radicalization programs racist in themselves? That's the question I've been Yes. Um, yes, of course they are. I mean, they're, they're stigmatizing and, 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 and a lot of the, the, the knowledge that seems to be, um, you know, neutral or whatever about Islam and Muslims actually comes of uh, feeds from a long tradition of, of racism and orientalism and exoticism and whatever. I do not need to explain this. I think um, at the same time, I think uh, racism and, and stigmatization is even, um, as you already said, you know, reinforced or reproduced or even, you know, um, strengthened by, you know, just 
um, being on high alert and just wanting to do anything and coming up with, with programs who are not really thought through. Actually, I mean, the Prevent pro program, I think one or two weeks ago, there was even a, a study or, uh, or official report by, by the Home Office itself, which would say that, you know, um, we have to rethink the Prevent program and renaming it, you know, Engage will not just, you know, do it because um, they are act it's actually counterproductive. I mean, it's not just that it's stigmatizing and that um, if you don't care for Muslims, then um, you should care that the prevent itself is counterproductive. So it actually, you know, um, leads to the complete opposite of what is intended. It leads to people um, feeling alienated even more from society. I mean, the, the, the report by the Open Society Justice Foundation is called Eroding Trust, and that's completely what it is. There is no trust between state and, um, um, and uh, the target community. The other thing is that I think the question should not be, um, shouldn't we do prevention? Um, of course, we, we, um, the question should be, should, should, we, should we still educate? And of course we should educate. I mean, just because education, education is so, um, so infiltrated, let's, uh, I know it's a bold term, but um, it's so infiltrated by the, the logic of prevention should not mean that we should stop doing education. But if, you, if you're doing education programs, you cannot blend out the fact that in the same, you know, uh, under, uh, with the same logic, people are referred to and stigmatized and racially profiled and, you know, um, are actually subject to human rights infringement. So you, it, it shouldn't go hand in hand. I think that... Um, of course, education, um, civic education is, is a nice way to go. Actually, in Germany, we have the Federal Agency for Civic Education, which I think is some, something that a lot of other European states um, are envious of even. But um, even there, interestingly, the Federal Agency for Civic Education is, is a body of government and needs to report to the Ministry of uh, Interior, which of, means that um, you know, securitization and the issue of security is always there. And we, uh, we can observe, um, you know, a growing um, number of um, preventive measures there too. I mean, um, they have to apply for fund, funds as well and they get their, their you know, their, their funding from, from the state as well. And if the prevent logic is there, it's there. I think um, good education, of course, means to open spaces and to have safe spaces and to, but at the same time, it should, you know, emancipatory, Civic education should actually mean that uh, teachers themselves, you know, uh, understand themselves uh, not as, you know, um, imparting the values on their students, but, you know, um, actually, you know, engaging in debate and discussing. And um, democracy is not, you know, um, it's not, you know, these are democratic values, uh, please subscribe to them or please subscribe to them or whatever. It should actually be, you know, part of. Um, um, yeah, a discussion, it's a process, basically. But in my conversations with Michelle before she was talking about, I mean, the fascinating thing is that she works with teachers on the ground, I mean, real existing people, teachers who have real problems with real students who storm out of the room when Holocaust education comes or refuse to sit next to a girl or there's things that happen. And these teachers also need tools to deal with that. And so are we suggesting just to get rid of these things? So, you know, what, what is, what's the solution? Well, I tried to show for me it's training. It's based on first training. That means to explain to teachers that their job has changed. It's not the same to be a teacher now than it was 20 years ago. You have new issues and you can't just say, oh, I'm not interested in that. I just want to talk about my, my topic or no, it's not possible. So that's one of, for me, of the main answers. Um, I would like to add just a word about civic education. I'm, I'm very fond of it, I love it. But uh, I, to me, there is another very important point that, and I really want to uh, emphasize on this. We have to update the curriculum in our schools because many, many European countries, they don't at all face the, um, the, act, um, the, the issues of the normal world now. I mean, you don't have geopolitics in many of our programs. Many teachers, have, they make omissions in the programs. They don't talk, for example, of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict with their kids. Uh, it's, uh, in France, we don't talk about the, world with, uh, the, the war with Algeria. You know, it, it frustrates a lot of the kids. 
they don't understand that. They, they're not happy with the curriculum. So more than civic education, we have to give them information. <coughs> we, we need to give them information about the world they are living in. I think it's really um, very important to me. I, I, and I think the issue that you raise around explaining how Europe as it is today is the way that it is today requires many countries, including Britain, to include in its education discussion about its own past in a way that it doesn't do. So it's about discussion about empire and it's a discussion about race and it's a discussion about the role of race in the creation of nation states and the creation of national identities. And I think in, uh, there's a great quote from Salman Rushdie who says that the problem with British history is that most of it took place overseas. And very few British people know any British history, let alone, um, well, all they know is essentially English history. They don't, they don't even know Scottish or Welsh or Irish history. They don't understand what's happening in Northern Ireland because they lack even that basic education. But I think when you speak, when you have diverse populations who have different historical narratives and understand world history from a different perspective, then you can't have contemporary society um, where people can speak to each other without realizing what, where those alternative narratives have come from and where, what's shaped their perception of the state, why the state isn't seen necessarily as a good thing, uh, hasn't necessarily been seen as a good thing. We had an interesting discussion recently in the UK about Winston Churchill, who is you know, seen as the foremost uh, Britain when it comes to um, voting for who's the best Britain. But you speak to people from the subcontinent about Winston Churchill and they'll talk to you about the famine in Bengal and the number of millions of people who died there. So for them, but to tell a British person that Winston Churchill is a bad person, that actually he's responsible for the deaths of millions of people is a challenge to them because that's a history they've never heard. Um, comments from the audience? Uh, anyone would like to, yeah, in the back, please. Well, please just wait for the microphone so everyone can hear you. Yeah, so I'm a teacher in London in a comprehensive school. So I teach in a, in a school where there's a lot of Muslim kids. So in fact, it's really mixed, and that's, that is the demography of London. We've got an incredibly mixed city. But one of the things I've noticed with Prevent is that you've seen a massive increase in Islamophobia, um, not just in schools, but in the press. So, for example, the Sun newspaper had a headline, we've got to talk about the Muslim problem, which mirrored entirely what the, uh, in, in Germany in the 1930s that was said about the Jews. So you, you've seen um, the EDL, the, a very far-right group, camping outside a police station in, in Rotherham, a small town, where there's very few Muslim children or, or, or residents, but they, they perceive the Muslim population as being predatory, um, sexual predators, and so on. So you've seen an, an, an enormous increase in racism and attacks on uh, Asian people who may or may not be Muslim just because they're brown. And I think for me, this is the fear of what Prevent has um, created in the sense that the government have have a, a huge program of making people very scared of other, when in the reality, um, you've got people who people have talked about on the panel as being rightly angry about the wars in Iraq, uh, in Syria, and, and feel kind of powerless. And I think the root of the radicalization which we see is rooted in the wars that our governments are fighting. And you know, we look at in Egypt today, the worst terror attack I've ever seen of 300 people dying. And it's almost like it's seen as a, as a European problem. So my concern is that we, I think we need to campaign wholeheartedly to stop the wars that are going on. And I think we need to recognize that a lot of the children we teach feel very alienated from a society who won't recognize their legitimate concerns or, or provide the housing, the health, as people have said, um, and, and really to address the racism, which, which I'm horrified has growing, uh, grown exponentially, I would say, in the last few years. And I think that's where we should be um, targeting our aims and campaigns. So stopping the war, and campaigning wholeheartedly against the racism that, that's growing in our countries. Sorry. Other comments or questions from the audience? Do you want to respond to that? Hey, hey. Um, just a very short comment uh, on prevention programs that are happening at the moment already in Germany, because uh, I'm, I'm working for an NGO that's working in this area. And I've lately interviewed a number of um, counselors who are working with families, schools, um, teachers, children uh, within the prevention and the so-called de-radicalization programs. And one of the main things that they mention every single time is uh, the importance of not, not only civic education and educating and equipping 
teachers to recognize so-called signs of radicalization, but actually equipping teachers within German society to, uh, to not just, just teaching teachers about uh, Muslim life in Germany, to teach teachers about uh, Islam, about Islamic histories, about different streams of Islam, different streams of belief, um, to not make them overreact, because what we see a lot is uh, a massive bunch of false positives, as, as you've called them. Um, the teachers call the police or these organizations and say, we have a radicalized person here, we have a radicalized pupil, and they are just wearing a veil, they're teenagers, they're maybe not acting out, but they're just being teenagers. And uh, that normal, normal German teachers are not equipped and don't know anything about Muslim societies, cultures within Germany and need to be, and need, yeah, need to be taught about this. I'm sorry if I'm just, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, just a comment because I think that's been left out a bit. Um, thanks for the, sh sh should I answer right now or yeah? Thanks for the, thanks for the comment. And this is something that um, um, I've, I've heard a lot, a lot actually that, you know, um, Teachers are, of course, not responsible for, for something that they did not get qualified for during their, their uh, qualification or studies or whatever. Um, at the same time, I, I really, I always question, you know, the premise um, that teachers should know something about Islam to, to talk to the students, you know, because um, there is, um, behind this, I think, um, this is what, what I mean when I say it's part of an hegemonic project, when you have teachers, um, Actually, you know, knowing something about Islam and um, being convinced that they have, uh, you know, a good, uh, good view on Islam, a good understanding, and not dangerous understanding about liberal Islam or secular Islam or whatever, then you're always in the danger of him having someone, you know, stepping in front of a class and saying, "Okay, I tell you what, I tell you something about your religion. Um, what did you say? Oh no, that's that's wrong. Um, I tell you how your religion really functions." And this happens a lot, actually. I mean. Um, one of the most common questions that I get in, um, in seminars that I do for teachers is, you know, can you give me like three or four good verses um, which you can use when somebody says something? Sorry, I can't. <laughs> I mean, um, because that's not the way to go. Um, this is why we have this little inside joke going on at the moment about knowledge and information, because I think... Um, we think of, you know, we always think of the other as being, you know, ideological and we ourselves are rational and our knowledge is neutral and whatever, but knowledge is always produced and, you know, um, subject to, to circumstances, part of discourse, basically. Um, so what, what I always try to make the case that, you know, um, teachers should understand themselves as, you know, um, trying to, to train skills with, uh, with, with uh, children or youngsters or whatever, so to, to gain information. But this also means that what, uh, what, the, what the kids make of the information is actually, you know, it's, it's open and the, and the teacher should not be in the position to decide what's wrong and what, what not. And this, this goes for Islam, of course. Um, just, just to come back on the point that you were making about how teachers are um, enacting PREVENT. So I think one of the most interesting things about PREVENT is because it applies to such a broad cross-section of the public sector, it's the first time that security policy is being delivered by non-security professionals. But part of that process is they're also bringing their own values and their own concerns and their own ideas and working out how they can enact it and implement it in a way that's more acceptable to them. So one of the, so it's, it, I don't think we should get away with thinking there's a blanket enactment in the sense that there, there, there were teachers that we interviewed who said, oh yeah, prevent becomes a way in which we talk about Islamophobia because if we want to prevent extremism, then our, my concern as a teacher, they said, was right-wing extremism and therefore we're using prevent to talk about racism and Islamophobia and so on. So there are different ways in which teachers, you could say, are either resisting the dominant narrative of what prevent is or taking it and using their own professional values to say, okay, this is how I understand it and this is how I'm able to uh, make sense of it within the professional training that I have and the values. So I think that process in which the policy from up here is then enacted down here is quite interesting because I think you'll have a wide variety of ways in which it's being done. Some of it will be done really badly and that doesn't get away from the fact that there's a fundamental issue as to whether any of these indicators mean anything but I think in terms of its enactment at the local level, what we tended to get a lot of the time was teachers saying we think it's a bad thing here but in our school because we're good professionals and we know our students and we're sensitive to the issues that our students have, 
we enact it in this particular way, and we deliver it in this particular way, but we're worried about what's happening elsewhere. Just to make a, a, a little addition to this, um, I, I observe this as well, but I think this, um, this, um, this good development actually comes to a stop automatically when there are positions uttered by, by students which are you know, um, then used to criminalize them. I mean, Palestine Israel is, is a very good example with, uh, because certain positions that are actually, I think, utterable in other spaces outside of Germany are not utterable in Germany. So a lot of youngsters who don't feel themselves being represented um, if if they, they, they think they, they get the opportunity to actually speak freely about something, they are then criminalized. You know, I mean, the um, so this there this development come, actually comes to a stop, and this criminalization is um, is enforced by by institutions and governmental institutions as well. So comments from the audience. Anyone who hasn't spoken yet. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just, just, sorry, just as a quick uh, reply to, to your response to my comments. Uh, I didn't mean at all um, to, to teach teachers about Islam so they would be able to talk back at people and teach them about the right Islam. Uh, what I meant is to educate them about the real realities of Muslim life in Germany, for example. Uh, as in, and because we see loads of cases where teachers in overreact incredibly if, if a Muslim student says Allahu Akbar for example, um, and they're calling the police and they're calling counselors, and that's what I meant, um, to sensitize them to just, yeah, not, not, to be, not, to, not to empower them to talk back at them, but to understand that maybe saying Allahu Akbar or praying um, isn't necessarily a sign of radicalization. That's all I meant. But I have a question for Michelle. <clears throat> Why is it that the Radicalism Awareness Network of the EU doesn't concentrate on Catholic radicalism, of which in France, but also in Germany and other countries, is, is, is a very serious problem, right? Why doesn't, and this is probably maybe more frivolous, but you know, why doesn't it con concentrate on free market radicals? You know, leading people of the FDP should get, you know. <laughs> Well, no, no, Ron is not, a, is not facing the right Catholic, uh, no, not at all. But um, we focus mainly on uh, hate speech, hate speech, and um, since last year we are working a little bit of right-wing extremism because it's coming into school a little more now. We, it's in France, it was very, you know, I was uh, working on, on figures to know how many cases have been reported on, this, on the issue. And two years ago, it was really, really few. It was 20, 20 a year or about. But now it's raising. Um, it's m much more in France now, and I think it's more over Europe. So we are going to, to um, train teachers to give them knowledge and to give them skills about uh, this new issue. But we are not addressing a whole of um, the situation of extremism, of course not. We are mostly focused on to speak the truth to um, Islamic extremism and now right-wing extremism. And some teachers say, could you speak all about of left-wing extremism also? But we have a few that are on this, so we, we don't do that this year. So other comments from the audience? Oh, it's, oh the, we're, we're at the end of our time, is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one last comment then, please. Yep. Uh, yeah, thanks for all the three very interesting talks. Um, I was very glad that the aspect of participation in society was brought up because I think, um, well, it's not my thinking about it, it's actually research um, um, that says that any kind of violence actually is a reaction to being excluded from any kind of participation. So it's just the other side of the medal or a coin. and. There was a lot of recent uh, research about that, especially in context of um, trying to prove Richard Dawkins and his selfish gene theory wrong. And so with this uh, research trying to prove that actually rather humans are a species having a cooperative gene uh, that is defining them, uh, all these um, um, research related to the reward system and what classifies as a, a, a drive uh, came up and that actually Freud was very wrong, Sigmund Freud, about claiming uh, the aggression drive, it does, doesn't actually, exi actually exist. And so a lot of um, 
uh, I don't want to, how to say that in English, I don't want to uh, uh, make it too positive now, <laughs> make it sound too positive what is a terrorist like um, aggression. But so um, there's, there's actually, it's, it's a statement. And um, so just like, like the Luddites who were um, going against being excluded from society by being taken away their jobs. They were not against the machines, by the way. For example, the looters in London, and maybe also those in Hamburg, I cannot judge on that yet, but so, so the looters in London, which have been only criminalized and also by a lot of research has been called like they're, they, they don't have any social or political view in what they're doing. So maybe it was also just some kind of subconscious um, subversion and not like a conscious subversion, but there was, there was indeed a political urge in that, even if it wasn't, even if they weren't aware of it, it's always about exclusion from society. And of course, a lot of other things. Yeah. Uh, well, with that comment, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating and uh, we can continue the conversations informally um, um, during the break. Thank you very much.